Today is the 80th anniversary of the last major RAF raid on the German city of Aachen. And there's only one man to have back to discuss that, and that is the fabulous Dr. Philip Blood. So about a year ago, we had Phil on to discuss the many bombings of Aachen. And you should go back and check out that very long episode because we do cover some of the same ground, but we have a slightly different focus because Phil has a new book coming out. And we're going to tell you all about that in just a second, because I have to thank our fabulous sponsors at the Pima Air and Space Museum for their continued support. It's getting into springtime. They've got incredible things coming up. So please do head over to www.pimaair.org to check out all the events and the things they've got lined up in the summer and the continuing build that they have going on for the Tucson Military Vehicle Museum. So back to Phil, because his new book, War Comes to Aachen, The Nazis, Churchill and the Stalingrad of the West is due out on the 26th of September from Hearst. And we're going to be looking at one bit of that. So our last podcast, a lot of that goes into the book, but we're going to be looking at the raid that took place 80 years ago tonight. And that's the one that's been described as the seven minute raid, or if you're in Aachen, seven minutes in hell. So we discuss a lot. And I have to say, be warned, we're going to be discussing a lot of things about war, operational and organizational genocide. It's a lot. So please go in with that. It's a fascinating conversation and a slightly different look at how we perceive and understand the RAF's strategic bombing campaign against Germany. Phil, thank you for coming back. The Aachen book is complete, so we're going to be delving into a bit more of Aachen's history. But tell us, the book is where and when do we get to see it? Well, it's a pleasure to see you again. And as you can see, I'm calling from London or London calling, you know, the old clash. <laughs> and uh, so the surroundings are not salubrious. But anyway, you know, I'm sure we can live with it. Uh, the book was done and dusted, from, from my perspective, on the 28th of February. Um, I started just literally writing in December, and I wrote the last lines on the 28th, and I handed it to the publisher that evening. Um, the target was the 1st of March. If I could get it into the 1st of March, then we were on target, maybe, I'm not going to promise, uh, for the 80th anniversary of Aachen being occupied by the U.S. Army in October 1944. And also, with like today, we're talking about the 80th anniversary of one of the raids. Um, this is all the time period when most of the activity is going on of an interest to the people on the 80th anniversary and the follow-up from D-Day. Mm -hmm. uh, the book apparently went to copy editing. Um, somebody you know... Uh, Steve, who does maps mm -hmm. and who did the pictures for our talks when we did hedge hopping, he's produced uh, the maps for the book. Fab. And my other half, Bettina, has um, put together a destruction map of the city from 1947. And that's going in. And I believe, well, the last conversation I had with the publisher they'll be in colour plates Brilliant. because they're quite impressive. So um, all in all, it's looking very good. I'm meeting with the publisher next week. Uh, the book's due in 2020, uh, September 2024. And so far as I can see, we're on target. I kind of read it. I read the manuscript the other day and I thought, wow, Mr. Typo. <laughs> <laughs> there's, going to, there's going to be a sound of copy editing but I had no choice you got no choice you can't be you know if you've got running to a deadline you're just going to get it done and so yeah there we are so the book's called War Comes to Arkin isn't it it's called War Comes to Arkin uh, and it's about the Nazis uh, Winston Churchill and the Stalingrad in the West um, I'm not going to go on why the Stalingrad in the West is important but it, it, it's in there. Um, it's a story of total war and how it impacts on a city from 1900 to 1965, which is basically when Winston Churchill dies. Um, I've tried to make it as personal as possible in the sense of 
drawing on stories from people in the community and, and lives of people in the community. Uh, but I've also included an enormous amount of archives. And of course, <laughs> as I think I said this before, there's probably more information archivally in Britain and America than there is in Germany for the whole of the city of Aachen. Uh, and that's a function of the city being captured in October 1944 and the surviving archives which weren't burnt or dis, uh, taken to the salt mines in Siegen by the, um, the Germans when they took Charlemagne's relics out uh, and put them in the salt mines in packing cases. Many of those files survived but if you go to Arkans records there's a huge dearth, um, big gap right in the middle um, and I luckily found them in America and um, the National Archives. The National Archives got them because the US Army gave the papers to the Foreign Office for translation. Right. So there you go. Mm. So you don't actually get the original copy, you get what survived are mostly translation papers. There are a few, but very rare. They kind of bin them. Um, and then what you see is how the story is then translated again. So they've translated it from German to English. And then along come a whole load of dudes who we know, like Bomber Harris and Omar Bradley. And they add their little bit of translation, which <laughs> tells their story. I've tried to put the story back to where it was. <laughs> it probably won't make me popular, especially as one of the leading characters I have quoted in the book and cited considerably is Slam Marshall. You know, anybody's favourite, no British, American soldiers don't shoot anybody. Um, and it might be a shock for people that those kind of characters are coming in and being used to describe the history. Right. So, so it's, it's total war um, with a little bit of postmodern historical analysis, huge critical analysis theme running all the way through on how to engage with the records and look behind what's actually being written so the, the last time we spoke about arkin for which if you want to go catch up with that which is probably a good thing to do before we have this chat links in the description below and all that good stuff that sort of makes up just a a chapter or two you said of of of, of the book as well doesn't it so it's it's a very it's a much broader thing than what we're going to be talking about today and what we talked about oh yesterday. yeah i mean um there was a hundred and well, it depends how you how you gauge them. And even to the very end, I found another raid, which I hadn't realised had happened, but which which was which was only disclosed as a what do you call it a diversionary raid on Arken with sixteen bombers, which happened while there was a major raid going on on Munich, while at the same time another crew was flying over and got shot down and landed in Arken. So. There's that, that kind of confusion in the records, especially from the American War Diaries. Um, I kind of missed the importance of that raid, and now that's been drilled back in. It's only small. It's only a couple of paragraphs in the book, but it's enough to show the continuation of damage and destruction. Um, I selected the 1943 raid, which we talked about before, yeah. as, a, as a single one-off chapter, because I thought... <laughs> With with maybe 175 air raids on a city, you you got to pick one, and it it could have been the one that we're going to talk today, um, which is in the book, but which it's the coup de grace raid on the city from the bombing perspective. But on the other hand, the fire raid was much more impactful because it severed the city from its pre 1939 past, if you imagine. Yep. If you can imagine that, it, it, I've done it in stages. So you've got the end of the nineteen, the pre nineteen thirty nine city, which happens in nineteen forty three. Then you have the death of the city in nineteen forty four, and then you have what happens afterwards. Okay, so you usually usual things when we when we when we have our chats, ladies and gentlemen. Trigger warnings. There's going to be stuff discussed. The 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 G word will come up. So, yeah, brace yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, buckle up, because here we go. So, as you said, we talked about the 1943 raid in depth and a lot of the things around it, especially terminology, um, 
uh, genocidal intent, things like that. In this 1944 raid, so when this goes out on the 11th of April, it's the 80th anniversary of that raid happening. So what's the background to it? What's been happening in Arkin? And, you know, why? I guess this is this is the, this is one of the big questions that's always worth asking is why Arkin? Why at this point? Because it's as you said before, there's it's well, it's a shell of itself. I, I'm not letting any secrets from the book out by saying um, basically after the July raid, Bomber Command seemed to spend nearly all of its time analysing the raid as having destroyed the city. Okay, so you've got for like three or four months reports from the operational um, directives and from the operational research guys saying uh, the city's dead. I thought the only way to compare with what the Royal Air Force is saying is actually to try and find as much evidence as possible about what the what's happening on the ground with the people. And of course, with so many evacuations and so many people not remembering what they actually were doing, uh, a few were, but it, it's that time period when you when you're in the post bombing period where they have impressions of what actually happened, which then get it's not so much erased; they get smudged. It's like the picture becomes very faded, and some people who thought they were doing one thing. Um, then looked in their diaries and said, oh, no, I was actually doing something else and I was in another place. And so th there's that post-bombing confusion of people. So I thought the only way I was going to get an accurate picture was to literally go through the industrial files that the, foreign, the British Foreign Office had translated and looked at, which to the average person of military history interest, they're not really very interested in how the Chamber of Commerce is functioning because you know, it just doesn't mean anything to them. I happen to know, because of all the research I did with the Chamber of Commerce, was to know that the Chamber of Commerce was actually running the city. So you have the Lord Mayor, who's part of the Chamber of Commerce, alongside the President of the Chamber of Commerce, all working together in like a war cabinet for the protection and preservation of the city and to keep it running. So as I started to look through the papers, I was astonished to, th to think that on, in July 1943, almost a week after the raid, they already had an assessment of the city's capability of um, restoration and recuperation. And 60% of the businesses which had been hammered were back working in production. In addition to which, there had been a large group of people um, who were um, deported is not the worst, the, the right word, evacuated from the city to places like um, Saxony in the centre of of uh, Germany, not not quite in places like Dresden, but mm -hmm. in the lower Saxony areas and um, Silesia and what have you. And it and the the intention was to give them respite, and I assumed by reading the papers they were actually planning to bring them back. So what you actually see is a city in rapid recovery after the most horrific raid. Now, bearing in mind that Hamburg the next week is getting hammered and all the emergency services have gone to Hamburg, understandably, so the, the Josef mm -hmm. Goebbels caravan buggers off up to Hamburg and all of the uh, fire brigades and railway volunteers and what have you, they all get reshifted like a massive mobilization action. But the Chamber of Commerce then says, well, okay, we can sort this one out and we'll have all our local, we'll put our workers, those who need the most rest to rebuilding, but only on a short period. So there were house sharing, there was active movement to uh, get businesses running. And a lot of the companies um, were actually up and running properly um, come November. So whereas you think this is a dead city a la RAF analysis, actually it's a fully functioning city again, not to the same level as it was before the raid, but to a certain extent it's still playing its part in the German war effort. So, so you, have, you have this, we'll call it an assumption. They, they've seen massive damage. They've then re-inflicted that level to a greater extent really on Hamburg. 
and there's a confirmation bias going on saying there's no way that they can they can recover from this and they they turn their view elsewhere meanwhile the city itself the chamber of commerce everybody is working hard to return the city to a semblance of normality as quickly as possible right now that's that's a good summary and then it gets confu it got confusing for me and it still remains to a certain extent a little bit confusing because suddenly the Royal Air Force started to bomb Arkan again. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that they do all the way through the war is to bomb on Christmas Day, which in Germany is obviously the 24th. And there's always a raid on the 24th, whether it's one plane, 100 planes, whatever, they bomb on the 24th. Uh, and they did catch people in church service and the usual things yeah. cl claimed about the Royal Air Force. What is more surprising was there is then a raid every day, whether they drop a bomb or a flare, one aircraft, a hundred aircraft, whatever, between the 1st of January and the 31st of March, 1944. Every day. An aircraft is over Arkan every day. That's not including the Americans that are using Arkan as a rally point. And... Bomber Command also using Arkan as a rally point for places like Cologne and Munich. So you've got to a point where the people in the city have had almost every day, even twice a day, the air raid alarms going off. So they're becoming wild. Um, but that's not stopping the, the city from working. All that is is... As far as I can see, the Royal Air Force intimidating the population, cheap. You can send one aircraft over, you can irritate the population, and it's cheap. There doesn't seem to be that many of a similar situation happening on Cologne or, or Duisburg. And so I started to get, and I'm, I'm still fairly suspicious, that it's because Aachen is the Catholic centre of uh, West Germany with its Charlemagne relinks and, and the monastery and the connections to the Pope and and its stand against uh, the Fuhrer, I think you've, you've got this situation where I think somebody, somebody somewhere is saying, let's disrupt that religious oddity of the city. Yeah? Yeah. Because they're not actually serving any other purpose than of a cultural attack. Yeah? It's, it's, it's aimed at the psychology of the people, their everyday social life. It's not really doing anything for the industry, apart from, presumably, keeping the workers up at night and preventing them from getting any sleep. But because the workers are in nice warm bunkers, which couldn't possibly be touched, even with a 6,000 ton bomb, they're still going to just carry on having a nice sleep, getting their decent rations and going to work in the morning and not being affected by anything that Harris is doing. So I come to the raid on the 11th of April and the various, the things that come about this raid that I find very fascinating is you no longer have the, the, the kind of aircraft participating like in July 43 with Stirlings and Halifaxes, what have you. The, the, the 44 raid is mostly mosquitoes coming in from Pathfinders and Lancaster's being led by a master bomber. And on, on one hand, it's a really brilliantly um, covered raid in the archives. I mean, it's so complete, uh, I was astonished. But in a periphery to this, and it's the map that I put on Twitter um, in, in lieu of this talk, um, there is a map of a zone of Arkan, which shows the zoning of the population and how the, the decision to bomb the city is made. Now, 11th of April, we have things to consider. One is we're getting into that period of point blank, Operation Point Blank, which is to support the Allied landings and transportation and oil and all those good things that they're going to blow up and support the operations on the ground. The question is, <laughs> here's the business <laughs> what raid is this about right so if you read the papers and you go along with it like you know those people who you who read the u.s bombing survey and believe every word of it 
we would be going down a route where we're just bombing a city to destroy the trains, the railways, the rail yards. And if you look at maps of Arkham, there's this ring of railroads that run from all the way around, and only one train at the top comes in, railway line at the top and in the north, comes into the, into the near suburbs of the city, which was used for the industries like uh, Velcro and these companies that were working for, on Junkers contracts. If they were going to hit those, the raid wouldn't take the route that it took. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and here's another clue to why it's not attack on the railway railroads, is that they boast about these six thousand pound flame bombs, fire bombs. So th this is what are those? Because those, yeah, we when we think of the, the big stuff, we think tall boy and, and and things like that. This is a very specific, very nasty weapon isn't it so you gave it a fabulous name when we were chatting before what what do they call these things well the the, the fire bombs yeah. the arson raids um i can't remember what what well, can you remember the word it uh, something barrel wasn't it um pickle barrels pickle no, barrels no no, 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 the, no. well well I, can, continue it it'll it'll come it'll come to me randomly oh, like probably a pencil barrel you just drop yeah. it out of the sky and go and yeah. then it blows everything up yeah there you go so the point the point of these this, this raid is officially it's to blow up trains which i assume is part of the shafe plan for bombing warfare against railway hubs and arkin is a railway hub as i've explained many quite a few times it's the lines that will, it, those lines will take you down to Belgium and France, and it's where the most troop lines would go through. And I'm still astonished that that railway line never really got attacked, which is why the Germans' reserves could get to Dido. I still, <laughs> anyway, never mind. That's a complicated thing that we won't include here. It's like remembering the word for the barrels. Anyway, by the by. <laughs> so we're bombing a city for the railways, and we know that fire bombs don't work against railways. So who are we attacking? Well, one will have to jump straight to the obvious one. You're attacking the people that are still in the city. That's right. Um, and the, the impression I've got is there's three targets. One is the flak. I think there's an, en an element of time for revenge. These people have been shooting down too many of our planes, and we know where they are, and we're going to get them. Because just just on that, so this this the the flak element will come to the city being used as a rally point because, as we discussed last time, it's a reasonably easy place to find when you're heading to that part of Germany. So it has yeah. a high flak concentration. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but also remember they bring in railway flak guns from Cologne, and the whole defence system is being ran from Cologne. I mean, I don't know if I told you, but last summer I actually went down to the tactical headquarters of the defence area for Arkham Cologne area, and the building has still survived. I took quite a few pictures. You could see where they had the boards up with um, showing, you know, the Kamhuber line um, mm. pressing the fighters. And what I learned from that story and looking at the way they ran the operations a little bit closely I noticed that the Luftwaffe was divorced from Arken. So here's okay. another thing. You've got bombers coming in saying they're going to bomb this city and for railways, um, but they're bombing with fire. And you've got the Luftwaffe saying that they're defending the city when they're not. They're not actually that interested in the city. And you, and, and you think that, first of all, you think that's a surprising comment. But actually... They're interested in engaging with the Royal Air Force in these boxes on another map. And quite often, the city gets lost from the process. Okay, so they're, they're, they're trying to, are they trying to funnel them into well-defended zones or areas that they know they can control? I would guess. But the, the thing mm. is here, the reason why I say this is there's no relationship between the Luftwaffe shooting down a bomber that's hit Arken and the propaganda press. Okay. So when the Arken newspaper announces 
that the boys have shot down a B-17 or a Lancaster or Halifax, there's mention. But if Luftwaffe shoot down an aircraft, no mention. Hmm. And it's almost like the Luftwaffe, did, <laughs> well, perhaps it didn't, but the Luftwaffe doesn't really exist in Arkham. There's no, there's no tactical base there. There's no centre of operations apart from the flak batteries and the searchlights. The, the main concentration is in Cologne. And maybe because of that, there isn't the idea of uh, the Luftwaffe protecting Cologne, Arkham as so much the Luftwaffe protecting the Rhineland. You see what I mean? It, yeah. I know it sounds a strange way of looking at it, but it's almost like they're saying, we're up there protecting the Rhineland. What happens to all the cities on the ground, that's a different matter. And I, ha I had to get my head around that a little bit because I assumed when you read and you listen to, uh, what's his name, Hajo, the, the German night yeah. fighter pilot. Herman. Um, yeah, Hajo Herman, um, talking about how they would look at burning cities and become very aggressive and shoot down planes every five minutes. I'm not sure they did. I could, he could be right. I'm not going to say that he's, he's lying. It's just that I get a, a, a much more different, much more subtle impression that the fighters are in those boxes. They're called up into that box area, which they are to defend and look for fighters, uh, look for bombers. They're being sent up to join the bomber streams and guide the fighters in. They've got the Schrager music, which is to allow them to go underneath a bomber, you know, and shoot from underneath and do all that good stuff. But I'm not sure that they're linked in in the way that you can imagine the Royal Air Force in the Battle of Britain are fighting for, say, Biggin Hill. Right. Or, okay. to, or to defend London. Do you, do you see what I mean? I know this is a complicated way of saying things, but it's when you find something which is so odd. Yeah, so it's, it's almost controlled defence. And the the boxes are there so that you know what is in that box and you're trying to divorce that from trying to defend a a city which in theory is defending itself through flak so when you're looking at the night fighter command they're more concerned about what they can actually bring to the fight which is these specific areas where they know what yeah, is yeah it's in like them. they're saying that our specialism mm -hmm. is to be up in the sky and to shoot them down mm -hmm. it's not to be floating around protect trying to protect the city and again i understand mm -hmm. that I've, I found it an interesting com concept that you would have night fighter pilots divorced from the target so that they're actually they're actually engaging with the stream as it's flying around and mm -hmm. then and that becomes an, a whole together altogether quite an interesting battlefield because you suddenly think actually as the stream's going around, it's attracting all of these different fighters doing all different kind of manoeuvres and operations. And it's quite an intense um, mobile battle. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it's it's on the move. There's a whole lot going on. And at certain points, at certain trigger points, they as they enter a box, they're triggering another set of fighters and they're triggering another set of defences. And it's... And that's, I guess, why you don't get any fighters over over the cities at certain key points, because that's not their job. And once they've determined where the bomber stream is going, that's that's even more interesting, because they, they, they kind of just go round and say, right, now we're going to get them on the way back. Mm -hmm. what, the, what the Lancasters do, which I find interesting, uh, and especially in this raid, is that they flew towards Cologne. Right, so, okay. So they're coming past, and all the observers are looking out, um, because the kids are now all observers as well as gunners and searchlight operators. And they're a, way, way out to the to the northwest of the city, like the Tivoli, where the Alamanyak can play football. And they're, they're, they're out there watching and plotting where the aircraft are coming from. And they see the aircraft, and are constantly reporting by land telephone. So you don't get radio communication signal issues. You've got um, the cables under three foot of ground um, wrapped in these steel and concrete um, tubes uh, so they can communicate. 
and so they can as they're watching the aircraft they're saying well the aircraft are taking the course towards cologne well actually the aircraft then suddenly bank round and come back through the uh, southeast area of the city aiming towards Beaveru. now what interests me is they actually land bombs directly with christmas trees you know the germans call yeah. them the, the the flares christmas trees mm -hmm. They actually have flares, Christmas trees, coming down on the flak positions, and they're bombing the flak. Um, one flak gunner managed to get one Lancaster down, um, but the bombs actually ran through several of the batteries, killing a couple of the boys. Um, and we'll, we might talk about what the reaction to that afterwards. Um, but then the bombing really let loose, and suddenly... Um, it became quite horrendous because the stream, and, and I find it very difficult to imagine this, but the stream is so efficient, it bombs the city in seven minutes. So they're in and they're gone. How, it's about seven, seven to 12 minutes. In, in raw, raw RAF records, they call it the seven minute raid. How, how, many, how many aircraft are on the raid? Um, I believe there's 420. So 420. I need to double check that. Yeah. yeah. So a, a, a large, it's, this is not a small raid, and yes, it is concentrated within an incredibly short period of time. Yes. Yeah. Now, no, um, Noble Franklin says they missed the point and they had to go round and go through it again. And they managed to stay within the stream of getting through, even though they've got to go round and they wow. bombed on target. And that was one of the few raids that he could actually remember in a bit of detail, so I could have carried it. What interested me was the master bomber was on top of it all the time, and he made sure that the bombing kept to the pattern, and according to all of the reports, um, the four corners where they dropped, using Obo mm -hmm. as their guiding mechanism, were all deadly accurate, Bennett was going on about how what a brilliant um, operation it was. Um, and they basically cut the swave right through the centre of Arkham, um, burning and destroying as much as possible. Um, I think a couple of bombs did land on the railway line by chance, but mostly the, it went right the way through. Now, in, in Arkham, the memory is that that raid was the most destructive. And I actually think that's an impression because the city had been scorched and arsoned the year before. So a lot of the, a lot of the buildings are already dodgy. Um, what's coming now is this like huge hammer blow. Um, what's fascinating is the, the, the British tell this story that the Royal Air Force tell this story that they've done this mega raid on the railways and the railways are, are not working anymore, which, um, but basically wasn't true. Um, the railways were working within 24 hours. This goes to, again, our, our, the, the, the perception conversation we were having before, isn't it? It's, we've done this thing, it looks terrible. The photographs that would have come back the next day would have looked quite horrendous. But then attention switches to somewhere else, so you have a confirmation bias that the railways are not working but you're not therefore maintaining the pressure because you can't because you you have other things to do. Well, I guess one of the problems, see, I think it's, you know, the more you look at transportation and point blank and it's all ill-conceived because I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because we were going to talk about maps. We're going to talk about them now. Spo the topographic spo spoilers, Phil, spoilers. The, top <laughs> the topographical <laughs> department's for the war office were drawing such incredible maps for the bombers. So, you, I mean, I, I put the one map up last week, which just uh, shows the zonal areas and showing the built up area of where the uh, most concentration of civilians are. Um, but if you look at all of the maps that they're doing, you have to imagine that they're making these base drawings of the topography of places like Arken and Hamburg and other places, then putting it on tracing paper you know, they will trace mm -hmm. around and then they will overlay that onto maps for bombing directions. So what you've actually got is a GIS system, a geographical information system, 
a very rudimentary one, but one that works because it shows layers of information and the targeting. Now, all the targeting for the 11th of April raid is for civilians, and all the language of the raid is for trains. Now, when certain, com when certain countries do that and say, we're not doing that, and then go and murder lots of people, um, we call it genocide. Now we have a problem here. So the question is, how intentional is this? Um, how deeply criminal is this? Because if you're saying one thing and doing another, there's clearly something going on there, isn't there? I mean, you, you're not just you're not just disguising what you're doing, but you're actually putting in weapons which you wouldn't use for the job that you're trying to use. Mm -hmm. And that you're, the, the master bomber crews and the, and the lead men, they're aiming, they're aiming for a specific target, and the specific target happens to be right in the centre of Arkham. Then you like find the maps, and you look at the maps, as, I, as we've said, and they're all showing certain targets, and it's either civilians, it's transport or industry. And so far, nearly all the bombing after 1942 has been not transport, it's been civilians. And we're still doing civilians. Because I'm, I'm looking at your picture now, and I'll put it up on the video. It is quite clearly defined. You have the railways and the one, two, three, sort of five stations marked, and then just loads and loads of, as they've put it, inner town fully built up, residential fully built up, and that's kind of it. So there's, if the targeting is of those built up areas and not the bits that are further out, which are quite lessly densely populated, then yes, that is a, um, I don't want to say troublesome because it's not, it, it, it's a, it's a direct, um, obscuring of, of what the motive is if you're saying railway but not going anywhere near them so then what I, so it, let, let's just move forward a bit so we know that Normandy was supposed to happen in May and the weather was troublesome and everything um, so there was a series of raids one was on the 24th of May which was a double raid so one one part of the raid went for Rota Erda, which is the um, industrial district of Arken, mm -hmm. and a small railway station there, but massive marshalling yards. And the other raid was to go to the Westbahnhof and the Hauptbahnhof and the main railways, which was going down to Normandy. So if they'd have done what they were supposed to do, those two railways, hubs there, would have been cut for a short period, and then seven days later they would be running again. If they, if it is. That's the way things worked with yeah. the Germans. They could turn around the bombing d damage in seven days, but you would have had seven days of possibly interrupted service in from the Arkan hub. And they did hit the targets quite well, but they kind of overshot on one of them. And it was an incredibly complicated raid. I mean, you got two sets of aircraft coming in, 260 aircraft roughly on each, each coming in at roughly the same time to take out two railway hubs over the same city, where the division between the two is maybe 3.6 kilometres. That's, that's quite interesting. I, yeah, you know. Which, is, which isn't far off what the lateral distance of a bomber stream would be when you have three groups of aircraft going out, yeah. So you do a good job. Um, but the the um, I forgot what they call it now when the bombs slightly missed um, and they didn't cause as much damage as they, as they should have done. So they went back now, and unfortunately on that raid a lot of aircraft were shot down. Unusual numbers of aircraft shot down. Um, I think we're into the nine percent kind of uh, calculations. One of those that suffered most was one of the Polish squadrons. I can't remember which number it was. But it, um, there's a picture of them climbing into their aircraft just before the attack. So 
Three days later, Bomber Command comes back to take out Rota Erda and doesn't just take out the railway line and the marshalling yards. It actually demolishes as much as, that, as, as you can imagine for the whole area. And we're using high explosives. And they completely and utterly turned the whole area into wasteland and killed several hundred people. Now, that raid was obviously devastating. Um, they were over in about five minutes. It, there was very little that the Arcanus could do. The defences were already shattered um, from the 24th. Um, that raid is the last big Royal Air Force raid and to a certain extent causes the damage which basically the Chamber of Commerce says, well, it's going to take some time. It's going to take till September um, before the city's functional again. So they'd put a five to six month time limit on the damage that had been caused. So we've had the 11th of April, which has caused no end of damage to civilians. And um, of course, it was a political victory in a sense for the Nazis because they used it to rally the city against the Allies. And they kept using that to um, rally the people as an example of how the Allies were out to destroy the German people and German culture and German society. Um, you had the raid on the 24th, which was in line with Point Blank. So the first one was probably not really Point Blank. It was just Harris doing his thing. Um, the 24th was meant to be Point Blank, but they were kind of missed. Uh, and then the 27th, the third one, um, was point blank and that um, did what it was supposed to do. And so you, you, you're looking now at questions beyond what the operations and you're starting looking at, you know, historical context and thinking about thing, how things work. And for me, I'm beginning to consider uh, a concept of operational genocide um, where you're factoring in um, into normal military operations a genocidal intent. Mm -hmm. Now the crews, they don't know and they probably don't understand until some time later. Um, this is the responsibility of the command. They're making the decision of what's going to happen to the city. The crews really are just they're taxi drivers to somebody else's evil. Um, they're not, you know, I don't believe, I mean, obviously there's going to be some people who have great resentment for the Germans, but I don't believe the vast majority of the Royal Air Force crews um, were into just smashing old people, women and children. Um, I think I think that is one of the, the cruelties of, of what's actually happened here. Um, the problem is, all the evidence, and there is just tons of it, and it's been out there since 1972. I've been very careful to make sure I understood when this stuff has been available for um, historians to look at. Mm -hmm. Why there hasn't been a deeper and searching examination of what the bombers have been doing um, till now. And I'm not saying that I'm at the cutting edge of academic history, but I am kind of using the geographical learning curve from Birds of Prey with the use of geographical information system type maps and the process of how you use geography to plot and destroy people. Here I am now using, looking at that experience from a different perspective and saying, well, what's the difference? There isn't a lot when you're putting 6,000 pound fire bombs uh, and many of them on top of a population living in in a city and now you know you have to now think that through because if you're dropping that much napalm and fire and phosphorus on people you know it's going to burn through the um, the cellars so you know you're going to burn the people in the cellars mm -hmm. you, if they don't burn they're going to be asphyxiated so the concentration of flame and fire and horror, um, that has a purpose. 
Well, it can't be to just destroy the cathedral, although they try. I mean, they hit the rat house, the old um, town hall, which dates back to the 14th century. Um, they actually burnt the skeleton of the rat house. I hadn't realised. Uh, in 19, it was propped up, and it was literally propped up with, you know... Um, scaffolding and things like that. Scaffolding and massive, great big wood bolsters... Um, like flying buttresses uh, holding the rat house up and I believe in 46 an architect went in and realised that the, the whole structure, the whole frame of the building had been burnt and so they actually had to fill it in with cement and steel so the rat house you're looking at now could easily have just collapsed into a heap of rubble the fact that it didn't, okay we're fortunate, it's one of my favourite buildings where I often take pictures of it much of the inter insides of the cathedral got seriously damaged. So the old medieval walls, which had the paintings of the knights and all, those were completely scorched. And if you look at the um, the main part where the where the services took place, all the windows, even today you can look up at the at the fine glass windows, and there's very few survived from the war. Um, we know that the young kids who were on top of the roof were trying to cut kick the phosphorus bombs off the roof. I mean. I, <laughs> there's absolutely no way I would. You've seen that roof. There is yeah. no way I would stand on that roof kicking off phosphorus bombs. Those kids were either very brave or very religious and believed everything about, you know, what the Catholic religion was going to promise them in the event of um, dying for the church. But there's absolutely no way I would do that. And they were up there doing that, kicking off the phosphorus bombs. Yeah. And I, I'm, sure, I'm sure there's listeners thinking of. Uh, the name of the verger who was on the top of St. Paul's during the Blitz, sort of putting the incident. Very, very different building. Um, I, <laughs> when we were there, I sort of looked up and went, it's an incredibly beautiful cathedral, Arkham Cathedral. I'm not going anywhere near. <laughs> it's very no. high up. It's very steep. Yeah. Wendy very kindly cajoled me to go up to the top of the Dormo and th that was pure and utter hell. So to be up there kicking phosphorus bombs <laughs> off they of were a building like that. On the roof. They were yeah. outside on the, and I was just amazed. Yeah. And even now you have to have all the UNESCO scaffolding around it before they even go on the roof. So, yeah. you know, um, so the man in charge of them was a guy called Stefan uh, Buchramer. And his is very famous in the street, one of the streets near that was completely and utterly uh, totalized, um, has been named after him. Just so, to, yes, just, there is a story there. Yeah. I, I just wanted to pick you up, up on that, that point of operational genocide that you mentioned before. So what we're saying is at, um, at High Command, which has gone straight out of my head, at Bomber Command, they are deciding this is the target and this is what we're going to go after. And then as they are producing those orders, they are, to a degree, obfuscating what it is they're going after. So by the time the, is it the B, the B rolls, the B lists are issued yeah. to the squadrons, B, B. yeah, the B form, we get to realistic targets, yeah, marshalling yards, factories, th things like that. But the aiming points themselves are such that they will be causing massive damage to population centers along the way. That's that's sort of that sort of ch chain of dilution as we get down to to what the, it's the navigation points and the aiming yeah. points for the pathfinders and the pathfinders are being told they've got to land on that spot there and that spot there. Um, and that's where we get the the musical parameter and, and, and elements of the, the musical parameter. <laughs> <laughs> I still find that amazing. Yeah. Um, it, which is funny because I've, I've got the um, from the IBCC they have one of the bomb aimers briefings for, for this raid and on the 11th of April and it says you know method across the top musical parameter mosquitoes mosquitoes will um, I can't read the guy's handwriting and his handwriting's a lot nicer than mine so that goes to, to say something mosquitoes will mark the AP with TI red approximately every two minutes starting from Z minus five um, other pathfinders will uh, mark the AP with green TIs, and then main force main air, main force aircraft should aim at the center of all red TIs visible. Otherwise, the center of the green. Yep. Yep. Well, those those reports um, are co quite considerable. Um, 
I, I find them fascinating because there was actually corrections in them. If you look at the originals, there's been corrections. Mm -hmm. So the final copy wasn't what the original was. Um, I always find that odd when, when people start playing around with official documents in those wonderful colors back then. Um, why are they doing that? Um, yeah, it's, so it was a, in many respects, if I'd have had the space, I would have had a chapter on 43 and a chapter on 44 as a comparison of the difference between the mm -hmm. two rates. Um, but I also think dear readers going to get very upset with increasing evidence of suggesting that the Royal Air Force is deliberately genocidal. And I'm not saying that the, that the Royal Air Force is deliberately genocidal. I'm saying there is an operational genocide motive and you have to locate where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. It's not that the crews are to blame. And I've said this repeatedly, it's not the crews that are to blame. Um, it's the command structure. And the problem is there was no oversight. So it's easy to say the air ministry, um, what was his face, Archibald something, I can't remember his name for a minute, Portal, mm -hmm. uh, he would be telling Harris what to do. But we know that every time he instructed Harris to do anything, Harris ignored him. We also know that secretly, um, over the coffee table, um, Winston Churchill was giving Harris all the support he required. The thing that I find incredible with what we've what we've but what we've seen in these two raids the subsequent may raids and then what happens afterwards and then what goes on into churchill's memoirs where he cuts out the raids where he walks away from the dresden raid is i actually found um a series of reports which were put before the cabinet office um, in march and april 1945 where all this damage was shown to the members of the cabinet, all the photographs, all the plans, everything, all just presented to the cabinet um, for cabinet responsibility. That's a statement in itself. Yeah, yeah. and 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 that that goes to that 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 wonderful phrase of command responsibility, isn't it? How how high up does it does it go, and and where does the the intent come from so if you if you've got orders from one side orders from another and you can select the ones you want and to be fair the overall tactic doesn't adjust massively through the course of harris's thing it's maximum destruction across the board isn't it yes and and, and we know from the people from the think tank in the foreign office that they knew exactly how far these raids were not working um, and that their reports were more and more suspicious of the way this thing was turning out um, so at some point you know I mean in the last one we talked about Shafe making the comment that what Harris was trying to do um, couldn't possibly work um, I actually think <clears throat> now, looking at the, the reports that were put through um, in March, April 45, actually showing the graphical pictures of all the destruction that was imposed on all the cities, um, <clears throat> going all the way back to Hamburg, including Wurzburg, Fordsheim, um, Aachen, all of these places. Um, it's like a catalog. It, it's, like, it's like looking at a management report where every page is the same. Yeah. And you're thinking, you know, when you do a management report, you're looking at all the pages and think, they haven't done the homework, they haven't done the homework. And you're looking at this lot. And to, saying, to, be, to be fair, Phil, I've, I've written report. a few of those reports. <laughs> I got other people to write them. I never wanted the responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, the, the, but the idea that they've done the same thing every time how many times do you need to be told this isn't working? So, yeah, you've done that to whatever, 1,500 cities, 150 cities, and you know, the numbers. Um, at the end, what, what do you have? You have just a, a record of wanton destruction. And as historians, we have to think again. Um, and I know it doesn't sound very pleasant because it means, you know, 
um, certain history books are going to have to be reconsidered. But I think that's the case. To a certain extent, what's actually happened is um, we've come to the end of the war. People like um, Churchill and the main protagonists, including Harris. Harris wanted to produce a report. <laughs> Here's another classic. Harris wanted to produce a report to be published with all the pictures of all the city's destruction. And the powers that be said, this isn't a very good idea. And when they actually looked at it, they said, well, you know, Harris is saying this, and we now know it's that. And I thought, well, if there's that, that shift, that sea change in attitude, why isn't that filtered into the history? Um, and I think probably, um, and sadly it's the case, they realise what they'd done at the very end and just hoped that it was just going to go away. Um, if you look at all the reconstruction programmes by the Foreign Office and British Army of the Rhine and all these organisations that were working, there's this kind of intent that, OK, the REF have caused this mess, they're now in command, they have to clean it up. So you have Schultz Douglas in command of um, the German uh, the occupation of Germany. And I'm wondering whether somebody secretly just said, well, you caused this, now you clean it up. I, I saw a file on Friday, which was staggering. Um, the, the level of work that was going into reconstructing Germany in 1946, you know, the actual idea of reconstruction, was phenomenal. <laughs> there was as much analysis going into that. And let me tell you, it was all about a few things like screws. So they're going, they're going down to literally nuts and bolts of, 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 of what's required. Yeah, with all of the, I mean, this one file in particular was uh, about the, uh, restoring the railways so they could be usable. And they were just looking at the num how much it was going to take to rebolt the railway lines so the railway lines could be used sufficiently and efficiently. Because all of these bolts were searing because then nobody had replaced them because the German war economy had been put to other uses so these bolts were not available. And the tonnages of bolts that they were expecting to use on a monthly basis were absolutely staggering. <laughs> and, and, and I was just amazed that you had operational research guys two years before working out how to destroy a city were now being put to how to reconstruct the economy. And then this wonderful idea came to me. You know, long before there was beaching and the destruction of British railways, there was the Royal Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> and that should be a book because all they do is write about the railways. At the end of the war, they're just, everybody's writing about the railways, the Royal Air Force, the Foreign Office. <laughs> and huge revelations. <laughs> That's right. Bloody trains, Phil. Bloody trains. Um, yeah. <laughs> but so when when we look at this this sort of chain of events here, and we're getting to this point where you have huge amounts of destruction, the railways themselves stay in pretty decent operation until quite late on, don't they? Um, due to the the effort that goes into to, to repairing whatever damage is here, when you have a raid on paper a month out from D-Day as with the original timelines for, for May. I suppose this this is the, the that sort of mental misunderstanding I have with it. Why are you still targeting populations when you are literally about, and I apologize for the use of the word literally, about to invade and you want to buy yourself as much time as possible? Granted, you don't want to do it too early because then there's time to rebuild, yada, yada, yada. Is, is this just down to the, the desire to kill as many people as possible because that's probably better than trying to destroy infrastructure? Well, I mean, the two 
the two guys who were at the top of this, one was obviously Bomber Harris, Arthur Harris. The other is Saunderby. Remember we had the conversation mm-hmm. about Saunderby and his fish. Yeah. Um, um, Saunderby, people forget, wrote the foreword to David Irving's book about Dresden. And you look at what's written in that foreword and you look at what's written in um, Harris's memoirs, you listen to how um, Harris talks on those Royal Air Force benevolent show programmes. You listen to how Bennett talks. You listen to how um, Leonard Cheshire talks. There is, there is an essence that, you know, and I think Cheshire is probably the most honest of all of them, saying that, yeah, we knew exactly what we were doing. But the thing with Leonard Cheshire, he was a master bomber. So he's going to know what these navigation um, requirements are. He's going to know what this actually means when you hit that target at that place. I think it's like when you had the discussion about um, the Northern bomb site, that not all the American air crews had Northern bomb sites. I don't think all of the Royal Air Force crews knew exactly what the hell they were bombing, other than that there was a target on that box that they had to hit and they had to drop everything in. The people who really know what's going on are a small group. Well, unfortunately, that's common to many militaries that are doing things which are not perhaps legal. Fair point, You're always yeah. going to find certain things that can happen. Now, obviously, at the end of the Second World War, you've got several things happening. You've got... Royal Air Force experts saying, well, it was collateral damage, which, of course, is the common excuse of the military. You know when there's a problem when the military say there was collateral damage. It means they don't know what they're doing and they've overkilled. So collateral damage should never be an excuse and should never be a defence. It's like saying that um, a guy attacked me with a knife and I took out a a 12-bore shotgun and blew his head off. No, that's not how it works. Um, in the, same, in the same context, um, all of these people, when they come together and they write their memoirs and they write books about what actually happened, and then you read the files, you know you've got a problem. So you've not only got illegal defences to illegal warfare, but you've also got a deliberate use of history to engage the public to believing something that couldn't possibly be true. Now, here, that, that, there's a huge problem with that because forever people are going to believe that Bomber Command was this and it deserved to have a campaign medal. And, you know, um, I, for one, think they should because they were very brave crews. But on the other hand, there's the other aspect of all of this which is something that was done was outrageously illegal. And you can't say, well, the Nazis were doing that because that's not a defence either. Mm-hmm. You can't say, well, the Nazis are killing millions of Jews, so therefore we have to kill millions of Germans. That, that, that just doesn't work. You, you can't use the tit, the tit for tat argument when you're trying to assume a moral high ground. Well, you can't put that before the courts. Yeah. No judge is going to allow that as a defence. You can't say, well, I'm killing, I'm killing Germans because they were killing Jews. Doesn't matter who you are. What, what? There's, there's no. That's just never going to be acceptable. And any legal, any democratic legal system is just going to say that's not acceptable. Um, obviously, you know, extremists. Um, you can, you can say that. Um, but you can see how they bring out various defences, collateral damage. The Germans were as bad. Liverpool, Coventry, Rotterdam, all the same excuses. But then you have to dial it back and you see, well, Bomber Command was already bombing before Rotterdam. Yeah. And they were bombing civilians. <laughs> they, were, they, were, they, were, they weren't bombing military targets. Bomber Command was bombing civilian sites. And as I said to you before, when William Shearer was in Arkham, he was being bombed by a 
a very inept air force that was bomb stringing bombs everywhere and killed 67 people in 1940. Well, that didn't change. It just got worse and worse and worse. And nobody reined it in. And I think to a certain extent, a lot of it is that the powers that be, people like Clement Attlee maybe and Morrison, they were so involved in their aspect of the war. When they saw the destruction, it was just another picture of destruction. Their mind wasn't attuned to it. When it comes to April 1945 and they see the extent of that destruction, then they say, oh, well, we can't talk about that. And straight away, Churchill's going to say, well, we can't have a campaign medal because somebody's going to look at that and look at that and say, oi. And it's like, you know, that discussion we had some time ago where the crews were given a, what was it, a Thomas Cook tour for the ground crews. And a lot of those ground crews came away from saying, we didn't know we were doing that. Well, of course you didn't know you were doing that. You were never intended to know you, you were doing that. Well, on those so cook tours as well, they were taking vast amounts of photographs. Yes. And, and you know, that, you know, it goes back to your point about Harris wanting to, to collate just the amount of damage that was done. Well, they were photographing most of Europe as well as taking people around and, and, and showing them what was, what was happening. Dan, Dan Ellen um, gave me some very interesting pictures of Arkham, which I'd never seen before. And they were from... Um, one of those Cook's tours. Um, but where does it all stop? Because if you go, <laughs> you don't actually have to just look at German cities. Um, the bombing of French cities and towns and villages to get the Germans out. I mean, you know, the, the, the extreme bombing of Arc of Khan in 1944 uh, to push the German divisions out. <clears throat> Maybe that was a bit of overkill. OK, but it's closer to the front line. What you're doing in all these bombing raids in, um, in, in Germany and, of course, Arkham being where it is, any of the local cities outside of Germany because of the frontier are getting bombed as well because the bombers forget where they are and drop bombs on these places. Um, so, it, you know, I think... I think there has to be, at some point now, we're going to have to have a reappraisal of what actually this bombing war is about and what ha and how it's impacted on um, the Western way of war. And I think one of the things that I find very interesting in the way that Arkan and all of these cities have, were bombed in the Second World War is the fact that it turns up again in Korea, that Winston Churchill wanted to bomb Kenya with the same... Um, approach mm -hmm. and he was stopped because somebody said we're not doing that again um, of course in Vietnam you've got the arc light um, raids and what was it linebacker I can't remember all the names now there were so well, many of them they, they, they reuse they reuse linebacker a number of times that they linebacker well you, you know you've got that b-52 mm -hmm. bombing raids over Hanoi yeah. um, and you know what was the comment bombing the Vietnamese back into the Stone Age. Um, that in itself is a genocidal statement. You have to think about it, but it is. Well, yeah, that, that was our old friend LeMay, wasn't it? Talking about was it? the Russians that was reused, reused and reused. Yeah, so it's... And and his his famous quote about the Tokyo Raid. But yeah, so it's... I, I, I can see where you're taking this in this... The sort of dam, the dam has burst with the overkill used in the Second World War. And whereas, as we had the, the discussions about uh, precision later on, you still are in this point where we can do this. And when the time comes, we will, which is what the Americans have done. Um, Vietnam. Well, I think what actually happens is on the ground level, you have overkill. Um, and you can see that with ground forces when they're pounding places. I mean, I've said from the very beginning, Putin's aiming his guns not at the Ukrainians, he's aiming at, at civilian centres and, and cities. And mm. that's what he's done from the very beginning and continues to do it. If you go back to Iraq and Afghanistan, we're back to this overkilling bombing scenario with heavy ground forces smashing whole areas and mega fights taking place while civilians are right in the middle. 
I think we've actually got to a stage where civilians have got to say, oi, we've had enough of you. If you cannot be trusted with your weapons, you can't have them anymore um, because you're killing us. You're not killing what you're you're not killing what you're supposed to be killing with those weapons. Yes. I think as I think the trajectory of you know history where it's been based on the military thinking that they can do whatever they want with impunity has to end. And you can see that has been continuing since the Second World War, um, on the grounds that yeah, well, we killed the Nazis, therefore that was a good thing. Well, actually, it was, but. You also killed all of these other people, including French people and Dutch and whoever, um, just to eradicate one enemy when perhaps it would have been more efficient if you'd used the Bomber Command to take out German troops on the ground. And it's going to be interesting, I think, over the next couple of months, the whether, whether or not the, um, I don't want to say debate, but the discussion around numbers of French civilians who are killed during during this D-Day campaign, which will be once again mythologized massively, actually comes to the fore because it's it it's it is an unknown number um, of people caught in terrible, terrible places. You, you, yeah. Khan, you can get we can get into a whole rabbit hole of Monty and his grabby hands with heavy bombers, but yeah, it's there's there's a there's a lot more to discuss and then fault as we were saying before on that recent TV show, which they don't terribly mention, targets of opportunity, bombing insignificant little towns where there is literally nothing there but people. Well, I think the problem, you see, this is where collateral damage defence um, becomes a serious problem because, yeah, you know, I just remember um, in that TV series, which I think we're talking about, there's a moment when they refer to the Emden Road. Mm -hmm. Yep. And... Um, what wasn't mentioned was a little raid on Eason's, which was um, a target of opportunity when um, the bombers couldn't see Emden because of the cloud. So they um, attacked a town which was listed as a target of opportunity, um, which nobody really investigates what a target of opportunity means. Uh, it just so happened that this target of opportunity had a dairy and a primary school and they killed 190-odd people, mostly children, um, for no other purpose than it was listed as a target of opportunity. Now, my, my comment there is, do you blame the crews or do you blame the people who put target of opportunity on a piece of paper that said to the crews, go there if you don't go there? I blame the people who put the instructions to the crew to make that decision. Yes, because if you put on that piece of paper, it's a dairy in a school. They're, they're highly nine times, out, ten, yeah. nine times out of ten, the guys are not going to bomb it. Yeah, I just know American. I know enough American soldiers and servicemen to say, if you say you're going to bomb a primary school and a dairy, they'll say no. Yeah, and they will use the F word when they're telling you no. And I think this is this is where you've got a very. We've got to be careful now about how orders have been written, which nobody has ever really looked at. You know, we're very good at saying, well, you know, you go to the National Archives, there's all this bureaucracy. People write all these stories and books about, you know, the exceptionalism of the Royal Air Force and the United States Air Force and how crap the Germans were and blah, blah, blah. But I think now they have to need to read the details again and say, oi, that guy who's written that order, what is he thinking? Mm. And who's instructed him to make those civilians the target? And why? What, what's the purpose of that? Because if, if the cabinet, the British cabinet, has already come to the decision with characters like Anthony Eden, um, Duff Cooper and, and, and these types of people saying, this isn't working, at which point do we say, OK, now we have to revise what's been going on and we have to think about what the bombing policy is. And I think those kind of issues need to be re-examined. They're not examined now because nobody's bothered to look at them. I happen to make one chapter of my book specific about this, and it's absolutely nothing to do with bombing Arkham. It's all about the direction of the war that's being taken that's going to lead to the destruction of Arkham. And, and you can 
you can see the politics of that coming in because if you change tact you have people immediately asking questions well why were we doing that and what have we done and that's po po politically um, inconvenient to have to start answering those questions well there were religious people there were um philosophers of all kinds of people who were saying this is a bad idea what we're doing is going to backfire now obviously it didn't backfire fast enough but i think as time has gone on there has been a growing concern with the bombing it's not that everybody is you know it's not there's been a lot of writers but there's been this there's an element of discomfort nobody could quite put their finger on it when i first started to ask the question you know you would say to somebody who was perhaps written something on the royal air force what do you think about the bombing command they say oh well you know it's a difficult subject blah 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 it's a difficult subject because there's so much paper mm -hmm. i mean you know um just for the arkham files alone i think we're into over 100 150 files um just looking at topographical files and targeting information files uh, for these last three days, um, okay, I looked at the, Bur the border regiment for a family friend and I looked at one or two other items, but there were 100 files, well, 112 files, which are topographical. Um, and then looking at all kinds of things. And one of the things that I've noticed about um, this operational genocide is how much those writing the orders refer to demographics and it's the same demographics that you see being discussed in all the wars ever since the second world war so you've got arkham being looked at demographically how it's going to be bombed where the bombing is who the civilians are what's their demographics like the catholics the protestants the the jewish community the slave labor the prisoners of war blah blah blah, -de -blah. the same kind of examination of demographics is taking place in subsequent wars so you see it with the way Srebrenica was anal analyzed when that was taking place how the analysis of the population was very central so here we are we're in modern war or as I call it now after 45 postmodern war we're in a time where everything is demographics and you know a large part of um, Putin's strategy is demography the russian population is declining you need ukraine to bolster the population it did that with grozny and elsewhere back in 1944-45 bomber command is thinking well how many people can we tie up in in there and how much destruction can we impose on that and how many people can we dehouse and how many people can we kill now it's very interesting that there's always dead in all the numbers so if the policy was only to dehouse people, you would have thought that they would send a raid in and with a big loud hailer saying, we're coming and we're going to burn you. Get out your houses. You've got half an hour. They don't. They come in and they do as much damage as possible, hoping to catch people exposed. And they are. Um, the raid on the 11th of April is at 23.45. And remember, mm. they've gone. They've given. They've given the impression they're going to Cologne, so the people have gone back to bed. So would would there have been an all clear in Aachen? Yeah. That, so mm -hmm. that, yeah, highly likely there would have been. Yeah. Yeah. But it took everybody by surprise, and as I say, it caught them. So you look, then you you see how I know I, I know it's kind of long winded, but we've gone out. We've talked about all this war making stuff and all of mm -hmm. these activities. And, and you now see when you come back to the raid why the concept of collateral damage is nonsense it's not a defense because there's no collateral but it is damage it's destruction yeah. and, and uh, it's and it's purposeful damage and purposeful. Destruction. Yeah. it is it is the primary aim and so we go back to the maps now the topographical department has produced a map which is they somebody has said to them show the civilian areas zone one and they've done a little round thing put one in there and said that's zone one and that's the highest concentration of people probably wasn't in 1944 
because many of those old medieval buildings, well, not medieval, but 17th century style buildings had literally just collapsed. And, and the rest probably had brittle bricks because when a, when a building burns, um, you get brittle brick because there's no wood and there's no frame holding them things together. You, you point your finger and the whole bloody thing will fall down. So it's quite possible there's an awful lot of people who weren't in that centre. But the intention to bomb people like that, because that centre of the town, that very core, which is, the, you know, from your memory, is the Rat House, the um, cathedral, and the other churches, like a little yeah. round bit. And then you've got the, the wall, which would have been the old original inner wall. That's the inner centre of Arkham and the cultural centre of Arkham and everything. Everything was there. So it wasn't just taking out the population, the civilians, it was also taking out all the culture as well. And that's another game. When you're going into culture war, I know that's a popular word at the moment, you know, term that everybody goes wild about on Twitter. I mean, what Harris is doing is culture war like you've never seen before because he wants to destroy anything and everything that's Germanic. And this, I, you know, what was it? I don't want the bones of a British grenadier dying for one moment for um, all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, okay, he's, he's, he's stealing an, a, con, uh, a term from Bismarck, but there's a deeper, there's a deeper issue there. It's not just that you're dehousing the working class people, you're denying them of all their culture. It's Stone Age business. Mm -hmm. You're back to this Stone Age thing. You're removing civilization, which is in itself a genocidal um, strategy, and you're breaking the demography of the city, and you're breaking the spine of the city, and you're killing a lot of people. And at, at the end of that, you've literally done the, the list of, what is it, the five lists that Dustin Duquesne talks about when he's going on about um, the genocide, the decisions that behind genocide. Now, as a historian, you're not supposed to take that bit of modernity and plunk it on, on uh, the past. And I agree with that, except for one thing. I can do that if I believe the orders are contradictory or illegal and were sent with a purpose to disguise. And I think all along now that Harris has been disguising the nature of his campaign. And we're going to have to come back to discuss that when you've done a bit more research on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, afraid it's, it's in a chapter of one of the books. It, it's where he gets demolished by his own people. And what's very interesting is when he writes his memoirs, he makes a comment about, you know, um, the attitude to Bomber Command. I think he's writing about the people who wrote about his work. Right. All right. Mm -hmm. But you have to read the books there. I'm not going to tell you that what, what he said, but <laughs> it struck me as fascinating that they'd got wise to him and they were literally kicking him out the door. And I was saying, yeah, it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. It, I, I'm really, I'm really excited for the book. I, I, I know very, very little about the Battle for Arkin itself. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And I, to be fair, I, I need to, we need to pop back. To be fair, we'll be here. We go meet up, have beers and things. We haven't managed that yet. But get over and you can do your, your one, your wander around the city and drag me around showing me how, how the battle played out. Because it is. People are going to find the book very different from what they expected. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you anything, but the book masks a lot of things and i'm saying masks mm. all right <laughs> well yeah i I'm, I'm just hoping you let me read this one early because you never let me read the other ones early phil as always this has been a delight we will be meeting up for beer shortly we can discuss that in a minute but uh what is the book called and when is this out what comes to arkan and it should be out in uh, september of this year fantastic Thank and you. it's been published by hearst mm -hmm. And there's colour pictures in it. Well, hey, and design god Steve Smith involved as well. Bring it on. There we go. <laughs> I, I miss I miss Steve. That's that's the big yeah, it was always always good fun working with him at history. Anyways, dear listener. I have to say, Hurst have done a brilliant cover. 
mm. and they've actually i think it's really interesting they've described the book better than me well yeah. kind of getting worried <laughs> I'm, 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 yes. no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure they've they've drawn up all, all of the fantastic content and distilled it there. So cool. Thank you, Phil. It was a pleasure. Always good to talk. I'm sure you can see there's a lot to take in there. And thanks for sticking with us throughout the show because it's a subject I find fascinating. We tend to have quite a narrow focus when we look at what happened with the bombing campaign and seeing that sort of flip side of it in Germany is very interesting as well because without turning things around we can't really get a full view of it. War Comes to Aachen is out on the 23rd of September from Hearst Publishers so be sure to get that pre-ordered. You can do that even from our very own Damcasters bookshop. Link in the description below. All that good stuff. As is all of Phil's socials which you'll want to follow because goodness there is a lot going on between now and then. So as always, thank you so much for your continued support. If you'd like to get these episodes early, slightly different edits, but also opportunities to meet some of our guests in our socials, you can become a damn guest here for just £3 a month, plus a bit of fat. Check that out via the link in our description below or at patreon.com forward slash the damncasters. So until next time, thank you so much for listening and joining us for this conversation. Let us know what you think. Send us some feedback. Give us a review. Like and subscribe. All that good stuff. And we'll be back soon. Thanks again. Do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damncasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.